All right, welcome everybody. How's everybody doing this evening? Uh, my name is Jeff McGinnis. I am the National Beverage Director for Wise House Family of Stores. Uh, very excited to have you join us once again with one of our winery spotlights. Um, this seems to be becoming almost an annual or if not annual, semi-annual host because he is so entertaining and more importantly, his wines are so wonderful. Um, let me introduce our special guest. First, we have Susan McElroy with Goldschmidt Vineyards. Uh, you are the national sales manager or what exactly is the title? I forget. Yes, I've just gotten a promotion. There we go. <laughs> I'm a regional uh, manager for the fabulous Midwest and you are one of our best customers. Right there. There. Thank you. There we go. It looks like you're hunkered down. There's no better wines to be hunkered down at your home with than the, uh, oh, the, yes. the lineup that you have uh, behind you behind you right there so um so she's she's obviously been a great partner of ours we've done these winery spotlights with i believe nick now a third time or this will be the time uh one kind of pre-covid or early part of covid but we also had one where he went around visited a lot of our stores in person i know we, we hosted him here in corville i have behind us some of the customers were there as well uh, and we have Nick with us. Nick Goldschmidt, obviously the namesake of the winery. He's going to be taking us on a journey, trying um, his beautiful wines, telling us about his story, uh, his philosophy sometimes, and sometimes philosophy as it relates to the wine industry as well. So welcome, Nick. Uh, my goal will be to sort of shut up, get out of the way, um, let you share the story. And then if there's questions, comments, things like that, please post those in the uh, questions and I'll try to facilitate those. So welcome, Nick. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Jeff. I hopefully you guys can hear me. I'm actually um, not where I should be. <laughs> I'm actually up in uh, British Columbia, Okanagan Valley, where I consult for a number of wineries up here. So I'm up here for the week. Beautiful up here. Um, quite interesting. If you follow me on Goldschmidt underscore vineyards on Instagram, I'll post a couple of videos up there that I took today. And right now the shoots in um, Okanagan are about this long. And the the clusters are still very, very small. Whereas in California, uh, our shoots are about um, two and a half feet already. And we are actually going through flowering right now in Napa Valley. In fact, on Sunday, we did, um, I went out and we, we, we saw some flowering in the Napa Valley. Um, the, uh, just a little quick background about me. I think a lot of you, well, most of you have heard my background before. I'm a ex-corporate guy. I'm from New Zealand. I trained in Australia. I lived in South America and France prior to coming to California in 1989. Uh, 1989 was probably the worst vintage in California. Uh, we haven't had one that bad since. I uh, was the winemaker at Simi for 15 years. During that time, I owned by Louis Vuitton, Moet Hennessy. They make a little bit of sparkling wine, but they also make a number of still wines uh, in six countries. And then uh, we got bought by Constellation. Constellation was much smaller back then. And so I was the head winemaker for that small division of Constellation. And uh, in 2003, or 2003 and then 2004, I segued my way out to the largest company in the world called Allo to Max. The brands would be Claude de Bois, William Hill, Lapis Peak, Gary Farrell, Mum, Buena Vista, Campo Viejo, Mark Stearns. Anyway, long story, we had 150 wineries. I didn't look after them all, obviously. It was around about 40 wineries that I looked after for seven years. Uh, we also got bought by Jim Beam, so I ran Jim Beam, and then we got bought by Constellation and got my job back. So the key thing was, in 2008, if you remember when the economy was not behaving, perhaps today it's a little crazy too, but the um, a lot of little growers were being let go by the large companies. And just a point of reference would be that Napa Valley is 80% of the land in the Napa Valley is owned by wineries and only 20% of the land in Sonoma County is owned by wineries. So in Napa County, you can imagine that wineries can charge a lot more because they're, it's all controlled by the wineries and so they can charge higher prices for their wines in general. Whereas in Sonoma County, we have a lot of small individual growers and a lot of these growers are too small for some of these larger companies, so they were let go. So we make a number of wines and we're gonna run through a mega plethora of them this evening that um, Jeff and Susan have chosen. Seven is a lot of wine, so uh, stay thirsty and we'll get through this. But uh, a lot of these, these are all individual growers that you're representing. So any bottle of wine that you tonight that you buy tonight, you're actually supporting not only my family, but you're supporting the individual grower that um, we represent as well. And if you want, you obviously can come out and visit those people, visit that grower, 
and um, be and see exactly where we make the wine. So I'm going to share my screen now. Um, hopefully, I haven't done this for a while, so uh, uh, let's see. So yeah, I want to thank Jeff especially and um, my new best friend Julie, which um, for putting us on here, and and of course Susan for helping set it up because I can't do it without her. Uh, this is the seven wines we're going to go through tonight. Uh, we're going to do three white wines, which is quite unusual to have two New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc side by side. They are from different areas in Marlborough, where in fact I was last week. I was actually in New Zealand. Well, actually 10 days ago now I was in New Zealand. And then we'll look at Fidelity, which is the only blend that we make. Um, and this will... Sorry, uh, Susan. Not seeing the order yet. Need to flip that slide. Mm. Can you see that slide? Only on the yes. side, but it's not up in the middle. Wait, that's your screen there. Okay. Yeah. Jeff, are you okay? Can you see it? I think it needs to be in presentation mode for the PowerPoint. Mm. Yeah, we're just seeing the first slide still. All right. Well, if I can't get this to work, I won't be able to get to work. If you hit front, hit that slideshow where it says from beginning up there in the top left, and then yeah, it should probably. I did. Okay. It might be, it just might be a delay with the uh, screen as well. Zoom, Zoom's been finicky with the Brazilian people on Zoom anymore. Yeah. Okay. Can you see the first slide again? Mm -hmm. Okay. The second one? No. <clears throat> All right, might have to go without. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, hmm. I think you had it a minute ago. It did show briefly on the full screen. Yeah. I'm give it an email. If you want to email to Julie, Julie can try it as well, and we can talk through first wine. Yeah, the videos won't come through though, but I'll send them to Julie. Can I have Matt? Right. Yeah, well, we can do that. It's just I can't do the. Uh... <sighs> Julie, I don't have your email address. I'll have to send it to Jeff. Oh, she's. Su no. Yes. Susan, can I send it to you? Okay. Mm. While we're doing that, do you want to start with the first wine, Nick? Yeah, you know what? I can't. I can't send it either. Okay. Right. We have to. I'll have to. Um, I'm going to have it on my screen. I'm just going to go through the tasting and look at it myself. Okay. <laughs> can you see me? We can absolutely see you a lot. Yep. Okay, because I can't. I can't see you guys either. Um, all right. So uh, yeah, the first wine is Singing Tree. So this is. Susan, you, this is a mess. Can you see Susan, you, Yeah, you're gonna have to go through the wines for me. All right, so the first wine is Singing Tree. So um, I never wanna make another Chardonnay in my life. And uh, the problem with Chardonnay today is that it's all clonal. And the definition of a clone means that all um, uh, comes from the same plant. So the definition of a clone is you can track everything back to one plant. and Today, the main clones that we use are Dijon clones and UC Davis clones. The problem was that, well, if you think back to the 70s and 80s, we had things called mass selections or field selections. So we used to go out into the vineyard and we would select cuttings from particular vines that tasted a certain way. And we would propagate those plants and we would graft it onto the rootstock. So when you go out and look at a tree right now, if you buy a plant, there's two pieces to the plant. There's the rootstock, which is, um, Okay, the rootstock, which is the base of the plant, and then we put the scion on top. So if you buy an apple tree or a pear tree, you'll see two parts to the plant. And the rootstock is selected to be drought resistant or, um, or dealing with some sort of insect that is in the soil, like a nematode or something else like that. In grapes, we have a, an insect called phylloxera, and that phylloxera has been really bad for grapes through time. So this is why Bordeaux was all replanted back in the 70s. And this is why California was always replanted, was, was almost all replanted in, the, in 89, 90. 
Well, some of these old vineyards still existed. And so I never, you know, so I listed a few Chardonnay vineyards that I worked for, and I didn't really want to make Chardonnay again, because as I said, everything has become clonal. And we had to go to clones because the new rootstocks weren't compatible with the clone. So um, we had great difficulty in planting vineyards. And so today, this selection that you're tasting is C, S, E, E. And this is known for melon characters. So if you think about warm fruit, like high-end warm fruit, like pineapple would be the most tropical fruit that you would get. Then you'd see um, melon and passion fruit. Then you get down to stone fruit and then pit fruit and then citrus and then grassy. So warm fruit to cool fruit. So what this wine is going to give you is going to give you this. When you smell it, you're going to get a melon uh, passion fruit character. So a little bit riper than what you would typically get from what a clone would be. So the clones are going to give you the stone fruit to pit fruit, if that makes sense. So it's going to be a little bit cooler. The other two terms that we use in wine, especially um, for white wine, is we talk about structure and texture. So if you look at a wine, a structural wine comes in your mouth like this, and it's very tight. The things that make a wine structural are CO2, the temperature that you serve that wine at, the wood that it's stored in, and um, acidity. Things that make a wine uh, more textural or come in the mouth broad and finish kind of broad is um, things that influence that are pH, alcohol, uh, malolactic, which we don't need to talk about, and sugar. So it's a matter of when the winemaker comes along, he has these sort of eight elements that he's playing with. Now, this wine that you're tasting, I want to be a little bit more on the structural side. So I leave, and the, and the way I do it is I trick the palate a little bit by leaving a little bit of residual CO2, and it gives you that that you're gonna see a little bit more in the Sauvignon Blanc when we get to that, but you're gonna see a little bit of tartness and brightness, and it's gonna make that mouth more mouth, the, the feeling in the mouth a little bit more um, mouth watering, so to speak. So um, I've actually got a Chardonnay in front of me. That's the only one I've got in front of me today, but you know, you're gonna get passion fruit and melon. And then when you drink the wine, you're gonna get, um, uh, you're gonna get a little bit more, um, of the structure. Nick, I, I know we've had this, Nick, I know we've had this conversation before because this is probably the third time we've we've started off with the Chardonnay, but the philosophy or thought with Chardonnay starting with the Chardonnay versus most wineries probably would start the tasting with the Sauvignon Blanc. I don't know. I can do either. <laughs> um, I think that uh, starting with the Chardonnay is a good way to go. In fact, you know, when we judge wines and wine competitions, we start with reds. We do all the red wines in the morning and then we do the white wines in the afternoon because what happens is your, your palate gets more tired as you go through and you'll experience that, you know, people ask, we can talk about this when we get to Hillary, but I mean, people ask me, you know, when do you drink Alexander Valley and when do you drink Napa? You know, my easy answer to that is you only drink Napa at the end of the dinner because your mouth's exhausted. I don't know why you would drink a big fat Napa cab with a salad. <laughs> it doesn't work. Um, so Alexander Valley is going to give you a little bit more structure and brightness. And it's the same thing with Chardonnay. So Chardonnay is going to be a little bit broader and a little bit bigger than what you're going to get with Sauvignon Blanc. So starting with Chardonnay, it's um, a good way to start the event because now we're going to go to a wine that's going to perk your palate up when we go to the Sauvignon Blanc. Does that kind of make sense? Hope so. Absolutely. I think that's on par with the explanation I've heard you give a few, a few times. And then one of the things you, you kind of said, one of the eight elements is you said malolactic fermentation. And you said, but we don't have to worry about that with S1. Your philosophy on mallow in Chardonnay versus non-mallow. Um, Look, I can give you, a, people think that malolactic and diacetyl, people, you know, it's kind of, wine's kind of a funny thing, you know, everyone has sort of an opinion about what they know, that they know a little bit about it and they, they think that's important, but I can give you a buttery wine that's got no malolactic in it at all, and I can give you a, a minerally tasting wine that's 100% ml. I can trick the, the consumer into, or the palate into thinking that. So what I look at, I'm not too worried about that. What I'm more worried about is preservative. And the preservative that's used in wine is sulfur dioxide. Um, 
So I want my wines to be really stable. So if you drink, if you open this Sauvignon Blanc, this is the 2020 that you guys are pouring tonight, which has got a screw cap. And if you, um, if you open that for five days, it's going to taste the same because I uh, make sure that that wine is really stable when it comes to oxygen. So I age that wine in barrel and don't add any SO2. So this is sulfur, not sulfide, sulfates or H2S that people get confused about. There is five different forms of sulfur in wine. Um, but uh, because I've got such a little amount of it in the wine, the wine is a lot more stable. So I add it like one month before we pump out. And uh, that's what I'm more concerned about. But to answer your question about malolactic, it's a bacterial ferment. So yeast ferment sugar to acid and like leuconostoc ferment malic acid to lactic. So it's a bacteria ferment. Now this is a bacteria that you can eat. It's not like Jack in a box. This is real bacteria. Um, and the, I just let it go naturally. So usually I end up with like 10% or 20%, like nothing. So very little when it comes to that. I'm just more interested in the stability um, of the wine without the preservative. Okay. So the second wine that we're going to talk about is, uh, which is the Boulder Bank Sauvignon Blanc. So Susan's holding up the label. The name of this vineyard is called Fitzroy. And Fitzroy is the name of my uncle. The stones come from the vineyard. In fact, I was in this vineyard about, as I said, about 10 days ago. We just finished picking the 2022 vintage. You're tasting the 2021. As you know, 2021 you're tasting, right? Yeah, they've got the brand new 2021. I just have a 20 bottle at my house. I haven't picked mine up yet, but yes, thank you. Good. Yeah, that's fresh off the boat. The 2021 is fresh off the boat. As you know, that you, you've heard the term supply chain used everywhere lately, and it's no different when it comes to bringing wine in from New Zealand. A container, the problem is that New Zealand is an export country and not an import country. So the containers arrive in New Zealand empty. And the last thing they want to do is ship an empty container to a country. So um, we, um, it takes a while to get the containers. So the 2021 vintage is actually just here, but we'll have 2022 vintage here before the end of the year, probably. Uh, differences about this. So there's, there's three main valleys in Marlborough. The, um, the main valley is the Wairau, which is where you guys probably will associate Marlborough with. The Wairau has two different soils in it. It has the Rapara and the Brancot. I can probably I can draw this for you um, really quickly. Map of Marlborough. So New Zealand looks like this. It looks like a big Y. So New Zealand looks like a big Y. Um, this is the North Island. I'm from right up here in Mangafai. And what we're talking about here is the top of the South Island. This is what Marlborough looks like. This is the Wairau River, flows into Cloudy Bay. These are the stony soils, which is what we call the Rapara. This gives you the um, grassy end of the spectrum. These are the Wither, Wither Hills. The glaciers came off the Wither Hills and formed what's called the Brancot. And um, there's a little area out on the coast called Dillon's Point. To the south, we have another appellation called the Awateri, and then another appellation to the further south called Ward. So the first vineyard you're tasting comes from the Rapara, and this is going to be a little bit cooler. Remember when I talked about warm fruit and cool fruit? So this is going to be a little bit cooler in terms of its structure. So, uh, but this is 2021. So 2021 is a quite a unique vintage because it was extremely small crop. And um, oh, there's, there's Susan with the little circles there, Rapara and Brancot, beautiful. And the, um, it's actually better than my map. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, in that yellow circle is where the first wine comes from. So this is, firstly, this is 2021 vintage, which was an extremely small crop. So converting from tons per hectare, uh, tons, to tons per acre. So we got about in 2021, we were running about eight ton an acre, which uh, sorry, 19, seven and a half, like six ton an acre, which is not very good. Um, when it comes to Sauvignon Blanc, you really got to crop it up at about eight ton an acre to actually break even. The, um, yeah, but 2021 was a cooler vintage. So you're going to have a lot of varietal character to this wine. It's a really, I mean, it's a really exceptional vintage 2021. 
um, but it's a very costly vintage because it was so expensive to farm because and to get a low yield doesn't really work. So when you drink this wine, it's going to be pretty bright. You're going to have good acidity. Um, and as I said, I leave a little bit of CO2, a little bit more CO2 in this wine to give you that factor. So the, the, the story that I tell about this wine is the first time I went to um, uh, Portugal with LVMH, I was making wine for roses. And you go to Portugal, you're drinking port, three ports for breakfast, three ports for lunch, and three ports for dinner. And the reason why everybody's skinny is that the food is really hard to eat. You know, they have these barnacles are about this long and you get three of them and it's 120 degrees Fahrenheit and you're drinking port. And I'm there for the three days. And I said to the winemaker, man, could I get a glass of white wine? The guy goes, Nick, we don't make white wine in Portugal. But the lady in the restaurant goes, oh, don't worry. You know, she comes out, she fills it up like my mother, you know, to the top. And it's condensation is pouring off it and it's 120 degrees. I get this wine and go, shit. Like, all the enamel on my teeth is gone. The roof of my mouth is gone. I'm like, what was that? But it was a Vino Verde. And, and what I always remember, like, that characteristic, like, when you drink a wine like that, you go, am I hungry or am I thirsty? And that's really what I try to do with the Boulder Bank. Like, that, that, that factor. Like, we can all, you know, even Jeff can sell one glass of wine. But can we sell two, you know? So selling the second glass of wine is always a tricky thing. So if you have a wine like this where you go, man, I'm thirsty. You know, that's the sensation that we try to get. I mean, we're trying to poke, you know, wake your mouth up at the end of the day. You've just had a long day of work. You come home, it's hot. Boulder Bank is the perfect wine to drink when you get home. It makes you think about food. It makes you think that you want to have another glass and it just puts you into that relaxed mode. It's fantastic. So I love Boulder Bank a lot. Um, and I'm sorry, I don't have it with me. And on the back of the label, yeah, Susan's pointing the sustainability symbol. There's only three appellations in the whole wide world where sustainability is measured. New Zealand, Chile, and Sonoma County. Even Napa County has not gone sustainable. So, or France, or Germany, anyone, all the traditional places. Anyway, so it's quite a, quite a thing to do. Um, New Zealand was the first country to do it. It was very difficult to do. But we're pretty much 99.9% .9 of all the vineyards are sustainable. In Sonoma County, we're about 80% sustainable now, which is fantastic. Um, yeah, cool. Uh, so in contrast, we're going to pour you the four, five, the Sauvignon Blanc. Now, this is um, it's going to be quite a different wine because this wine comes from the, uh, from the Brancot. So the Brancot has more glacial soil. So it's going to have a little bit more water holding capacity because you can imagine when you've got more soil, it can hold more water. Whereas in the Rapara, you're talking about rocky soils. And so uh, there's a, it's a lot more free draining. So you get more of a hydroponic uh, process uh, in the Rapara. And I will point out the neighbours for Boulder Bank are extremely famous. You know who they all are. Uh, Cloudy Bay, um, Alan Scott, um, Paratai, which is Martua's top one, you know, the wine with the fin on the, the whale fin on the back, and um, uh, Stonely, which I still think probably Stonely is one of the best, um, the best vineyards in all of, uh, in all of Marlborough. So, but the forefathers vineyard actually used to be Kim Crawford's Spitfire. So you guys know the brand Kim Crawford, of course, uh, and his top wine was uh, Spitfire, which was uh, $32 a bottle back in the year 2000 when he sold the company. We owned the vineyard and I was selling the grapes to Kim. And uh, when he sold the winery, we took the grapes back. Uh, there's a couple of things I do differently to this, to the Boulder Bank. Obviously, firstly, it comes from a different soil. And then secondly, I want to have more texture in the wine. So we do not sell this wine to anyone outside of the US. So it's only sold in the US. Whereas the British drink more New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc than anyone else. But, you know, New Zealand's got the best food in the world, but no one to cook it. And the British have got the best chefs in the world, but no good food to cook. So um, we don't sell this wine to the British because they have a little bit more texture, you know, because we eat Mediterranean food in, in the US. And so I really want to have a wine that has a little bit more body and so that the way we do it is we age it on juice leaves, not wine leaves. It gets complicated. But when we process the grapes, I leave it sitting on the juice leaves for um, 10 days before I rack it and ferment. Most people hold it for about six hours and then rack it and ferment. But that's a way that we get more texture. The label itself that Susan's holding up is called Forefathers. 
meaning the forefather appellation for that variety in the new world. So we have a number of wines that we make under this label. Uh, the one that Jeff would be able to get his hands on is the forefather's Cabernet, which is an extremely amazing wine. And we only make uh, 200 cases of the forefather's Cabernet. Susan's actually holding that up too. Uh, on the label, you'll notice, so this is before layer cake, cupcake, and all the other bloody cakes. So we make a Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc, a McLaren Val Shiraz, an Uco Valley Malbec from Argentina, a Cabernet from California, the four best appellations for those varieties in the new world. It's a pair of boots that I used to wear when I walked around Simi on the label. Uh, faded out writing is my constitution. When I became an American citizen, I wrote my own constitution about sustainability, organics, and biodynamics because my second degree is in that. Uh, and then you'll notice the signature on the bottle is actually John Hancock's signature. I stole from the constitution and changed to my own and wax is the name of the bird that eats all the grapes. So this is a memorial to every bird that I've shot. Whereas the first wine also has a tree on it with birds. The singing tree has, a, has the birds on it, but we don't shoot those birds because we live in California. So anyway, that's the difference. So anyway, quite a different wine. I hope you got to see that side by side because it's not often that you get two single vineyard Marlborough Sauvignon Blancs from, from uh, two very different appellations within the same area. Uh, if we drove from one vineyard to the other, it's probably about 15 minutes. So they're not that far apart, so pretty close. So who likes wine number one? Who likes Boulder Bank? And who likes, let's see who likes Boulder Bank over Forefathers. Oh, a couple of people, a couple of people. Well, I prefer the forefathers over the Boulder Bank, but that's just me, because uh, that's more we're my pretty, style. A little, we're little we're full, a little richer. We're pretty here in Coralville. I also have Brandon Fr Brandon Finn from Okaboji here, and he's, he, uh, you like the forefathers better? He said it has more texture. He, he described it in kind of a saw blanc can be kind of a creamy, creamy like a, a sharp, creamy sharp can. It has that tech, has that texture and 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 characteristic to it. Good boy. He said exactly the right term that I like to use. So yeah, it does have the right texture. You little beauty. He's doing it. He's doing go ask job. Mark. He should go ask Mark for pay rise. You got it right. Here, well, well, this is being taped. He can use it with him when he comes in and talks. All right. The third, the, the first. So we we specialize. I mean, mostly what we do is Cabernet, but we're just going to do a little red first. This is a red blend. It's the only blend that we make. Uh, it's called Fidelity, and I'm a, I'm a marketing genius. I launched it on Valentine's Day, put a heart on the label and called it Fidelity. This is why I'm in production. <laughs> Anyways, what happened was um, a buddy of mine was going bankrupt in 2004, and he called me up and he said, you know, I got a problem. I went up and I tasted all the wines, and they're all really good. The winemaker is a great friend of mine, Don Fraser. So we pumped, and then they had, he had all the varietals all separated. And so we pumped all the 2000 together, all the 2001 together to 2002. And I called up a, a major retailer called Sam's Club, and they agreed to take all the wine. We launched it on Valentine's Day, as I said. Anyway, he called me back two years later and said, Nick, I don't want the, you're holding the Zin for up, Susan. We're doing the Red Blend. Um, we're doing the Zin. Oh, we are? Yeah. All right, forget what I just, oh, well, I'm still telling the story. It's part of the story, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Same story, different one. Um, never let the truth get in the way of a good story. So uh, anyway, he, he couldn't, he didn't want to sell the last 500 cases and it was a red blend at, at that time. We still make the red blend. It was a red blend that I was talking about. And um, the next day, 92 points best by wine enthusiast and the buyer for Sam's Club called me back and said, can I get the wine back? And that's why today it has a broken heart on the label. We don't sell this wine to anyone other than small independent retailers. So you cannot find this and you will not find any of our wine at Total or Costco or anything like that. So small independent retailers and wine clubs such as Wine Styles have supported us all the way through this difficult transition through 2008 and today and supported all these family businesses. So, um, you know, we're beholden to that. And, and so this is the only way to get it is through Jeff. The wine that we're showing you tonight, we make we make two wines under the Fidelity label, but these are the two blends. And that even though it says Zinfandel, it has about seven, seven to 12% in any particular year of um, Petit Syrah in it. And Petit Syrah gives a little bit more spice and a little bit more color than what Zinfandel does. 
The vineyard itself we own. It's in the heart of Geysville. It's right in the middle of Alexander Valley. And it's called the rail yard. The rail yard because there's two railway lines in the back of the, uh, the vineyard, which is highly controversial. I, want to, I don't want to go into details right now, but they're talking about bringing back uh, the railway for a, um, a controversial use. We can, we can, you can Google that later. Um, and also it's the name of a very famous rugby stadium in New Zealand, which was imploded unfortunately. So this is a memorial to the, uh, to the amazing rugby stadium that used to be called the Rail Yard in Wellington, where we, I went to many, many times. What you'll find is by the, the vineyard is, is, is we, I was speaking to um, Doug Raffinelli the other day, and, and Doug says uh, he classifies old vine as 75 years old. Well, that's like 80% of all the vineyards, <laughs> all the old, all the Zinfandel that's being planted. Only recently have there been more plantations of Zinfandel going in, I think, because people are getting a little bit tired of drinking Cabernet every day. But this um, Zinfandel is really unique. It was owned by, oh, sorry, it was uh, contracted to the largest Zin producer in Sonoma County, which you probably know who it is. And uh, we bought it and he wanted us to sell the grapes. So I ended up, after a long, after a long story and a contract that went foul, we ended up making the wine ourselves and uh, hence it has become super successful. The wine age stays in stock for about six months and we run out. I can't, are you pouring the 19 or the 20 though? I thought you were pouring. Uh, they're pouring the 20. Yeah, so the 2020 and already that I think we're about halfway through the vintage and we only released it about two months ago. So if you guys are interested in this particular wine, it's a huge value, a, a, a very good price, very great value wine. Um, and uh, yeah, so get your hands on it if you like it. I also try to make uh, it a little bit lower in alcohol. You know, Zinfandel is really hard to control the alcohol, but most Zinfandels are 15, 16 alcohol. We, we always are under 15, and my, my endeavor is to try and get it closer to 14 and a half, but it's very, very hard to do because with Zinfandel, you never know really what the sugar is because there's so many raisins in Zinfandel when you harvest it. And there's also green berries in the same cluster, so very hard to control. But I hope that you can drink two glasses of Zin. That's really my goal, because you know, again, we can all sell one glass, one glass of Zinfandel, but can you can you drink two without falling over? You know, so uh, that's my goal in life is to be able to drink two. And I try to keep it in a real red, jammy, juicy fruit. You know, I think of Logan berries and raspberries when I when I think of this. I try to keep the oak a little bit light, just so that it maintains the fruit freshness. And I try to keep the alcohol low so it doesn't have that cloying, sticky, um, sugary finish that a lot of Zinfandel do. Cool. Question. Any questions? Obviously, uh, yeah. Well, I mean, question. one question I have is you obviously have vineyard in vastly different parts of the world. How do you manage, obviously, seasonality, you know, obviously different hemispheres, but aside from that, you're in Canada, Canada now, but you have vineyards that are that are shooting in New Zealand and you have ones that are that are starting to grow a lot faster in California. How do you manage all of that while you're away? Um, I have, well, the first thing I need to do is congratulate the people that I work with, of course. Uh, most of these, in each country, whether it's Chile or Argentina, which are the other two places we, we control vineyards, um, the, um, I have really good people down there who are ex-corporate people like myself, who um, I entrust dearly, you know, and I've been working with these people for 20 to 20 to 30 years. And then secondly, Jeff, I'm a very good scheduler and I've been running the same schedule for 30 years. So I can tell you, I can tell you in five years exactly where I'm gonna be when, which week, which month. Um, so, you know, March, July, November, I'm always in Chile and Argentina. I'm always in New Zealand in February, uh, April, sorry. I'm always in California, September, October. And I'm up in Canada. At a, in Canada, I do real quick. I'm, I, you know, I'm in and out in two, three days. Um, so it's pretty easy for me to do that. And then, you know, somehow or rather, I, I try to jam in eight to 10 weeks of sales in the US as well. The, the only thing that happened this year though, New Zealand opened up for the first time for New Zealand citizens and I needed to go see my father. So I'm paying, I'm paying the price for uh, being down there for three weeks a, when I'm not usually there for that long. So um, hence I'm trying to jam in a lot. I've actually, to be honest, Jeff, I've only been home two weeks this year. 
Um, right, so the next one we're gonna show you is Chelsea. And so we're gonna show you all three of my daughter's wines. So the year is 2000. And I was explaining to my children what it was like to live in Chile during a dictatorship. For those who are old enough, you'll remember one of the, one of the few dictators that actually gave up, um, that's a very old photo. <laughs> the kids are shorter than me. They're all taller than me now, Susan. That photo must have been taken in like whatever, extremely old. Um, the, um, so in, in Pinochet used to cut off the electricity to, he's a very famous guy, just so you know. Pinochet is the only dictator to have ever given up leadership by democracy. He actually put it to the vote and walked off so into the sunset. I happened to be there that night. I was there that I was there the night that he gave up the leadership, and I was actually there the night that he died as well. Was, anyway, me and Pinochet, you know, we're tight. Anyway, so um, he would cut off the electricity, the oil, the power, or whatever he did to control everybody in the country. During this, you know, this is in the eighties, and so making wine with electricity is right, really difficult, but it is possible. So myself and the five kids, we made wine together in two thousand without electricity. So we hand picked, we handy stemmed, we pijage punched down, we basket pressed, we hand pumped it to the barrel and then we, we hand bottled it. And so we, make, we made a wine called Five Gold Hands Unplugged. It was uh, one barrel of wine. And um, it was a great undertaking. Anyway, so 2001, Chelsea said that she wanted to make wine with me too. So on the label comes from when she was two, I traced around her head and she colored it in and that's where the label comes from. And the vineyard itself is actually a very famous vineyard too. For those that know a brand, well, when Claude Bois was famous, they, um, recent times, it's not so famous, but Claude Bois used to have a wine. Their top wine was called Milestone. It sold for $75. And this is the same vineyard as Milestone. But instead of $75, we're selling a little cheaper tonight. And um, the secret about Merlot, and firstly, for the people that, oh, I don't drink Merlot, Trust me when I tell you this. I'm not going to go into detail tonight, but I can give you Cabernet and Merlot and you cannot tell the difference. And I can give you Napa Cabernet and Alexander Valley Cabernet and you cannot tell the difference. And I can see some of you going, no way, that's, that's a bunch of BS. But I did it to 72 sommeliers back in the year 2000 at CIMI and we had them all confused. No one could tell, no one could pick the four Merlots from the four Cabernets in the tasting that we did with 72 Somalias had a go at it, they couldn't do it. So if you think you can do it, I don't think you can. Um, so, and remember, Petrus, one of the top wines in the world is Merlot. Um, Pomerol, which is my favorite appellation in all of Bordeaux is all Merlot. So Merlot can be um, very full and very rich, but there's one key element with Merlot that people do not, well, even winemakers, I feel, don't fully grasp. And that's, you've got to have a little bit of clay in the soil because the clay holds more water than loam and gravel. So this is a, a sandy clay loam. So loam, and this is a textural thing about um, soils, but clay uh, can hold more water. It releases the water a little bit less as well, but it actually has that dampness and that moisture right throughout the summer. And so that's what Merlot needs because Merlot is a bigger berry than Cabernet. So if you dehydrate Merlot, you're concentrating the sugar acid and the tannin, and that's not what we want. But with Cabernet, you've got a much smaller berry. So if you dehydrate Cabernet, the effect is not gonna be as much. So the way to keep Merlot lush and sweet and round and ripe and, and all that is you've gotta have really good turga. And this wine's, for me, I get a little bit of licorice character to it. I get a little black fruit. Chelsea wanted to make Merlot, but she wanted to make it in a Cabernet style. And this is why we chose this particular vineyard. So it's big, it's full, it's rich, it's lush. And at the same time has that Alexander Valley, like a little bit of structure. When you drink that wine, you still have a little bit of that red fruit brightness, which is really attractive. Uh, we dial back the oak. I've been gradually dialing back the oak and gradually dialing back the alcohol on this, on this wine as well. And uh, 2021 in California was a little bit difficult. For those that um, have read up on it, you'll know that uh, 21 was one of the hottest vintages ever in California, even though we didn't have any fires. 21 was a really hot vintage. And so it was very early, so it was very hard to control uh, the sugar because we, 
we had to pick so many vineyards so quickly. And um, but 2020, despite what you may have heard about 2020, it's a really it was a little bit cooler. We have a little bit more fullness and fleshiness in that wine, and um, I'm really happy with the way the 20 is. But yeah, I had to dial back the oak, of course. Any questions on Merlot? People like Merlot again? Yeah, yeah. Honest, <laughs> honestly, this is one of those the, the bottle bottle of wine that when people say they don't like Merlot, that we use as that benchmark to prove them wrong. Because at that point, um, it it has everything that a, a great made cab has, but then it has a lot more. You can tell. Yeah, some people say I could tell it's Merlot, I could tell it's Cab, I could tell it's from there or where. But at the end of the day, it's it's just a great bottle of wine, and so you almost pour it in wine for folks and not even tell them that it's Merlot, and they're like, "Hey, we love this. You know, where where can I find this Cab?" So. Yeah, no, that's that's the point, and um, you know, uh, it's quite good in in, in California and Northern California. Um, we sell it at uh, there's a chain out here called Oliver's. Um, Oliver's is probably the, the preeminent um, supermarket out here. We've got about eight of them. And um, this is the fourth best selling Merlot in Oliver's after Duckhorn Decoy in St. Francis. Um, so, yeah, and it's and obviously it's a hell of a lot cheaper than Duckhorn and Decoy. <coughs> All right. You guys into the reds now? I think we're I think we're powering through. Are we ready for what's next, Catherine? Catherine. Uh, so Catherine, this is um, it's called Stonemason Hill. So the Merlot is called Guidestone Rise. Uh, this is uh, it was after a, a huge rock that was um, in the entrance of the vineyard when the previous owner owned it, and uh, the rock has been moved to the back of the property because they couldn't. They, well, they had to dig a well and they couldn't get the truck by, so they had to move the rock anyway. So it's still there. Uh, Stonemason Hill, unfortunately, I can't show you the photos of what the, um, the soil looks like, but trust me when I say the most sought after soils in Alexander Valley are, well, to be honest, I didn't know that this vineyard had this. Um, yeah, it's from a little bit further up, where a little bit further up. Um, on that left-hand side where Susan had a finger a minute ago. The, um, the best soils that we know of in Bordeaux are compressed um, granite and slate. And that's what this vineyard is. I, when I did, I'd been buying fruit from this vineyard for about 20 years, 25 years, and the vineyard became available for sale. And I knew that the quality, this, this is how ignorant it was. I was kind of stupid. Um, the wines that we'd be making off it have been phenomenal. But I'd never actually dug a soil pit. And when we decided that we would plant this thing, we, we ripped out um, half the vineyard immediately. And in fact, we're just planting the last piece this year. But when we dug the soil pits, I couldn't believe how much granite and slate there was. And you could see the roots, you know, going through um, the soil, very poor soil. And so the, um, the vineyard is, um, uh, well, it's everything that every winemaker could dream of. But the, the beautiful thing, and I, I don't know why this came up in conversation, but I was in a, I was in a, a pretty famous vineyard and with, with a, I'm sorry, I was with a pretty famous consultant. And he said, wherever there's rock, there's clay. And sure enough, when we dug down, we were down um, two and a half meters, multiply that by three feet to the meter approximately. We're down two and a half meters, uh, we hit clay. And so that was where I really wanted to break up the soil because I wanted to be able to have the roots get into that clay so that in the future, as the vines get older, <clears throat> uh, those vines would be able to hit that moisture. And so even though they'd spend all that time getting through the rock, they'll be able to get to that moisture in the end. And so we planted a very deep rootstock uh, that's gonna be a lot more drought resistant than most of the other rootstocks that we have today. And I'm really truly excited about the next generation of stonemason that will be coming um, online in the next two, three years. So all in all, this is a vineyard that I've been working on for, as I said, 30 years. And it was made up of a, um, uh, another property, but as the brand has grown, so it will actually include two properties. 
the base property was, is a big valley that is now owned by five growers and we buy grapes from all of those growers. And then the second property will be the one that we own um, and hence the name Stone Mason Hill. The other story that I'll share with you about the about having daughters. Now we have five children as Susan showed you and I, I can't quite see all you guys, but um, uh, you can imagine, you know, the worst phone call you can ever receive from your wife is, you know, this one. Um, honey, I'm too drunk. I can't go to the parent-teacher night at school. Okay, this is every father's worst nightmare because this is a lose-lose situation because you know that you're going to be the wrong denomination <laughs> in the room, probably. And, um, and remember, this is, this is uh, you know, 25 years ago now. Um, I think us men are a little bit more liberal than we used to be. Uh, and, um, but it turned out to be a life-changing experience. And Susan's heard this story multiple times, but the, I arrived, and, I, and this is why I don't believe in star sign either. There's a lot of things I don't believe in. I don't believe in terroir either, but that's another whole conversation. But I don't believe in star signs because what happened this night was they broke the room up on firstborn, secondborn, thirdborn, twins, and lastborn. So I'm at the big boy table, right? What do, what do firstborns do? The firstborns go, right, no introductions. We're all sitting down. There's a piece of paper on the table. And we all started answering the questions. And at the bottom of the paper, it said elect the spokesperson for the group. So what do firstborns do? They wait 10, 20 seconds. I know volunteer to be the spokesman. You know, if no one else will do it, I'll do it. You know, firstborn attitude. I put my hand up. Along at the same moment, the other 13 firstborns all put their hand up as well to volunteer. I'm like, dude, this is crazy. The secondborns are like, hey, can we get a firstborn over here? Because you know what the secondborns are like. They think they're shy, but they want a firstborn to go over and help them out. And the middle children are like, what was the question? Because they're all still talking about themselves. And the rest of the room is like working. And then the last ones are like, we ordered a cheeseburger. We don't even know why we're here. And I see this in my kids. And it was really interesting during COVID um, because all five plus two partners moved in. So there was nine in our bubble. And to see the first ones and the, you know, the middle children and the last all sort of work together each night to prepare dinner and open, decide which wines we were going to. By the way, we drank 1,500 bottles of wine in 18 months. The average white guy has an average age of 84. So I'm 60. So I've got 24 years left times 365 days. I've got 9,125 bottles left to drink. But because of COVID, I'm easily going to hit 10 grand. You guys with me? <laughs> <laughs> We're going to talk to anyway, <laughs> I probably lost you at first point. Anyway, so when I look around the room, and, and it's funny, I um, I think when I when I talk to people now, I, I often ask them, you know, what birth order they're in, because I sort of know how to talk to them. Because, you know, middle children always say, and you middle children already know, firstly, you middle children want the microphone, because I know that. And you are always saying, no, this is not true. We are not the um, manipulators. You are, because middle children are the lovers, the peacemakers, and they, they're the glue of the family. But to do that, they manipulate. And so I see that in the kids. And you'll notice on the label that the label is facing a different direction because Catherine is the middle child. So she's, she's an amazing daughter. I mean, she's the most incredible daughter in, in that regard. And um, I can send Jeff a video, actually, of, of I was hoping to show you a video tonight of her actually talking about herself and how she manipulates people. But, um, yeah, just just really nice. So Chelsea and, and um, uh, Hillary face one direction and Catherine faces the other direction because she thinks outside the box. She's a she's a creative genius and just a real pleasure to be around and she's there's nothing that ever gets a middle child down they're always happy they're always spunky and pushing everybody and having a good time and, you know i don't know they never seem to see the bad in people so yeah middle children are root they're certainly uh, something to be admired and they can keep up that sort of energy all the time you don't think you'd be able to pull that video up well Sorry. i can do it i no, i'd have to go on youtube so i'd have to go off screen for a second um but anyway so 
yeah, that's what Catherine's about. So when you drink this wine now, um, this is a hugely popular wine. So the other the other wines that we compete with, and you you know the other wines. Um, so this is the fourth best selling um, off premise Cabernet over twenty bucks in California, and the competition are Rodney Strong, Saint Francis again, and um, um, who am I forgetting? <laughs> One of the other. Oh, Alexander Valley Vineyards, ABV. So they're the big fellas, and uh, we're close and behind. And the um, I just think I just think that well, for me, of course, each one of those wineries has changed winemakers since we've been making Catherine. So maybe that's one thing. But the second thing is there's two things. It, it, it's for all the cabinets, really. It's a total hands-off approach. A sort of I learned a lot of this in, in Chile in a valley called Colchawa. Colchawa has a lot of Cabernet and very dry tannin. And that's an extreme case. And so we, we don't pump over, we just let the wine soak. And that's what I do here, really hands off. And then the second thing I do is I leave the wine on skins for a long time. So you know how wines go from purple to red to brown to orange? These wines only go purple and red. They don't go brown or orange. And you'll never see crusty stuff on the side of the bottle because that's, when you see crusty stuff, that's polymeric pigment falling out. That's the preservative for wine. When you see that, drink it or give it away. The last daughter that we're going to show is Hillary. Now, Hillary is, she's a, uh, Chelsea just finished her master's in biology. Um, Kate's a vet tech and Hillary's doing bioengineering at Davis. So they're all science and the two boys are science as well. The, um, but Hillary was supposed to be a boy. Uh, she was going to be called Sean. And uh, she popped out and she's a girl. So we very quickly had to come up with a very, with a New Zealand name for a girl. And of course, who's the most famous New Zealander? Anyone know? Sir Edmund Hillary. What Sir Edmund know? Hillary. Sir Edmund Hillary has got one L. And um, he, she, so her nickname is Eddie. So Edmund Hillary. So that's, that's um, uh, where the name comes from. Uh, this vineyard is the, so there's two wines that are the best value wines that on the table that we can't be beat. The first one is the Singing Tree Russian River Chardonnay. There's pretty much nobody selling wine at that price for a Russian River Chardonnay. And the second one is um, Hillary, because this vineyard is in Oakville. So you guys all know Oakville. And um, so you can see Opus One there. And um, yeah, we're all over the place there. So we're across the street. Uh, on the same same one as Opus, and we're actually moving across the street to Napa Wine Company because this vineyard is getting pulled out. Uh, so, um, yeah, when you when you um, when Kim Jong Un drops a nuclear bomb and you show up at the bunker with your one with your one bottle of Opus, and I got my three six packs of Hillary, who do you think they're going to let in? I leave the answer there. <laughs> it pretty much, I mean, it's the same soil. Um, but right there, but it's not the only winery. There's Nickel Nickel is right on that end as well. Even Tokolon is across the street, which is a very famous area, which is where Mondavi makes theirs. Um, yeah, so I try to make this in a really bright style. We just released the 2019. It's um, really sort of black fruit, black cherry, quite different to the to um, Catherine because uh, Catherine is um, Alexander Valley, and that's going to be a little bit more red fruit. So you're gonna have to get a little bit more. So this is the, just going back to the question that I posed earlier, when do you drink Catherine and when do you drink Hillary? When do you drink Alexander Valley? When do you drink Oakville? So when you drink, um, if you think of Alexander Valley as a little bit more red fruit. So you think about um, red fruit, Loganberry, raspberries, and then strawberry, and then black, um, blue cherry, sorry, red cherry. So red cherry, blueberry, black cherry, that's where Alexander Valley sits. Napa Valley sits blueberry, um, black cherry, and then a little bit of black berry, so it's cooler. The other thing that's different is because Alexander Valley has less alcohol, it's a little bit more structural. And Napa Valley is sweeter because it's got more alcohol. And when you have more alcohol, the yeast die and they don't finish the fermentation. When you don't finish the fermentation, you end up with a sugar called fructose and fructose is very hard to ferment. So there's two forms of sugar, glucose and fructose. Yeast can ferment glucose very easily, but they only ferment a little bit of fructose. And if you run out of time, 
the fructose remains a suspension. So when you drink Napa Cabernet at 15 alcohol or higher, which a lot of them are, you're drinking a hell of a lot of sugar. There's a hell of a lot more carbohydrates when you drink a lot of sugar like that. So, you know, this is why if you had one gram of sucrose in your mouth for glucose and one gram of fructose in your mouth, the fructose tastes a lot sweeter. This is why Coca-Cola is made with fructose, not glucose. So just be aware of that. So when you're eating food, drink Alexander Valley. It's got red fruit, a little bit more acidity, and it's fruity and it's fruit driven. At the end of the meal, when you're eating your cheese course, stay away from chocolate and sugar and other stuff like that because it totally destroys the wine. Um, drink the Napa Cabernet because that's going to be a little bit sweeter and fuller in itself. And if you have a dessert with it, it's going to kill it because the dessert's going to be too sweet even for, um, even for Hillary. Okay. Was that seven? Was that I'd seven words? Add one thing because we don't have any 2020 Hillary because of the fires in Napa. So snap this up now, guys, while you can. 19 Hillary. And Nick, thanks for being here. Oh, yeah, sorry, I couldn't. I couldn't get the slides to flip. That's funny. First time that's ever happened. But I or, hope no, I. Um, um, hey, one question. Anyway. One, one question we always get is, um, you know, I know you. I know you take a. a an approach to have these wines be approachable immediately upon release, you know, drinkable, excellent wines. What about the ageability of some of these? Well, that's what I was alluding to earlier. So let's talk about Cabernet because that's obviously the one that people age for the longest. As I said, remember I said, um, wines move from red, sorry, purple to red to brown to orange. Our wines will go purple to red. In fact, I just said, um, I've had two recent experiences. Um, I had the 2006 Catherine and I had the 2001 Catherine, both in the last three weeks. And they're both still red. And the reason being is this compound. Now, I'll give you one little bit of chemistry, okay? Just to round it off for you. Um, you guys all remember, you know, you guys are all chemistry majors, right? I know that I can tell just by the, the, the fun times that you're having um, tonight, drinking wine and, and uh, but you'll remember these things. You remember back the chemistry class that you did go to when you probably stopped going was, um, you know, these um, benzene rings. You remember benzene rings? Well, this is, this is purple. And see, you got two hydroxyl ions there. And even you guys know this, two hydroxyl ions, the OH molecule, they go together, it forms a water molecule and it cleaves off. And that anthocyanin, which is purple, joins onto another one and that becomes a tannin. This is red. And you provide more heat, light, air, and time, that compound gets bigger and bigger and drops out. So I get it to do that in the fermenter on the skins. So that's why you don't get any crusty stuff on our wines. And that's why our wines stay purple and red and don't go brown or orange and prematurely age. Does that kind of make sense? So yeah, when Kim Jong-un drops the bomb and we'll go to the bunker for 15 years, take the Goldie wine. Take the Goldie wine with you. That'll last. Oh, and I thought it was really funny, Jeff, that they, the wine enthusiast came out with the 40 best winemakers under 40 years old. I called up the writer and I said, uh, thanks for that. They're exactly the ones I'm not taking to the bunker. Because they haven't made wines for, for uh, 15 years. If I'm down to that bunker for 15 years, I want to buy a wine that's been made for 15 years, but let alone from the same vineyard. you got to know how these things behave. So anyway, I'm waiting for them to come out, the top 60 winemakers over 60. Maybe I'll make that list. I don't know. I'm sure that I'm sure they're working on that right now, right? Yeah, right. They sure they listen to me. They listen to me. Yes. Uh, well, or or the top top winemakers with with productions below a certain amount, a certain amount of wines. So that's the other one they won't do. So anyway, well, I tell you what, this is always an enjoyable event. Um, you know, we've done this before uh, many couple times. We'll probably do it again in a year from now. Once hopefully you're back oh, out and busy. Jeff, no, it's sooner, 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 sooner. Well, you you can always visit any of our stores. I'm sure many we have. I think uh, Johnston's on West Des Moines, Ankeny, Chicago. 
um, Sun Prairie. Uh, Sun Prairie is actually training um, in West Des Moines right now. Um, so I'm sure they're getting a, a nice handle of these wines, um, as well as a few of our other stores that, that will they'll carry them and, and definitely feature them as well. Still one of the only winemakers that said the first, first and only thing you need for an in-person presentation is a whiteboard and a marker. That, were, that, that, that was the requirements. No, no fancy Skittles, nothing like that. Just a whiteboard and a marker for your on per, on in-person presentation. So, uh, but these wines are amazing. We definitely appreciate um, everything that you do to make this happen, um, as well as all the work that Susan does, um, as well as Julie and everybody on our team to make these events go over quite well. Certainly the wines are the star, of it, but everything else that goes into it um, is very appreciated as well. Um, we have all these wines in all of our stores that are participating, as he mentioned. Many of these might be in short supply, um, and there's other things that they make. Uh, for example, Fidelity Red um, that we can get our access to. I know in Iowa actually was bugging, uh, bugging uh, Brandon here. Um, he says they have some of it in stock. So appreciate everything. Um, enjoy the wines. Thanks again for coming out. Um, thank you, Nick. Thank you, Susan. Yeah, I just want to just want to thank Wine Styles again for being a huge supporter and. And wine styles is a really unique um, situation because you're spread across a number of states, you're small independents, which is phenomenal. And any opportunity we get to talk to your customers is fantastic. But I just want to leave you with the point, you know, like I really want to thank you guys for supporting small individual growers who I represent. Um, as I said, each one of these vineyards is um, something that uh, you can come out and visit. And as I said, uh, please follow me on, <clears throat> on Goldschmidt, which is obviously on all the labels underscore vineyards on instagram you can also find me on youtube all those videos i was going to show you and um susan could probably just drop your email into the chat susan so everybody could find you if needed and jeff if um if uh you could send me the um the store managers as well i, I could i'd love to send them a couple of photos that i didn't manage to show during the presentation and i'd really appreciate that too but absolutely thank you Again, thanks again, you guys. And uh, Susan will put her email address there so that you guys can contact her. So thanks so much. Thank I got a long drive. <laughs> See ya.